It's great to see you this morning. Welcome to Central. Let's stand together. And let's start off our service worshiping together through song. singing this morning as we give glory to our God. He alone is worthy. Mighty's, oh mighty's. 
why we're gathered here this morning to give our God glory. Amen. It's great to see you here at church this morning, and it's going to be an awesome day. Right now, we want you to turn to somebody you haven't seen yet. Just shake their hand and say good morning. because we get to be here at church this morning, uh, but because tonight VBS begins. Woo! <laughs> yes. A little more lively than the first service. Well, I am so excited that you're here. We are excited that you're here. Um, yes, VBS does start tonight at 6. If you are a volunteer, um, a part of the leadership of uh, VBS, try to get here about 520 so we can get in our spots and we can be ready uh, for the, the kids that are already signed up and also the kids that have not signed up yet. Um, decorating will be going on at 2 o'clock today. Uh, the doors will be open so you guys can come and decorate if you need to finish up your rooms or just get ready or just mentally prepare for what you're going to have to do this next week. It is going to be wonderful. Uh, and we also thank you for, for being so involved and, um, and it's just wonderful. So um, if you are new to Central and you have not filled out one of these Connect cards, um, a little bit later in the service, there will be an um, offering plate that will pass by. If you will fill those out, stick those in the offering plate. We just want to connect with you and just say hi. Um, and right now, Don Worley is going to come up and, and actually share uh, some from the pastoral search committee um, about kind of where we are and where we're going. So, Don. Thank you, Noah. Okay, well, it's good to see everybody this morning. I just want to take a few minutes to uh, just bring you up to date on some, some things we've been doing as a pastor search committee um, and then make you aware of something we're going to, really important going to happen here in just a few weeks. So when we began this process, we learned very early that we are not just hiring somebody to fill a position. This is a spiritual process that we're going through as a church. And it's going to take a while. It's going to take some time to play out. So I had Ryland put together a little graph that shows you uh, behind us, some of the steps are involved. Some of those who work with pastor search committees have identified 15 major steps. And we are currently at step three. And step three is the, this, the, the idea of developing a profile for a pastor. You like that? They like that in the first service too. Uh, step three is developing a profile for a pastor. And what that means is we're looking to develop characteristics that we believe God has for the man that, that he will bring to us. So let me tell you what that, what that involves as far as the search committee, what we've been doing and what we've been working on. Well, the first thing we do every week or every meeting is we spend a lot of time in prayer. Um, we, we have been praying a lot, and we spend a significant amount of time in each meeting praying, just down on our knees, seeking God's, God's heart and God's face about what the next step is, about uh, what kind of a pastor he would have for us. 
we have spent a significant amount of time over the last couple of months looking at what the Bible says about a pastor. Um, we have looked at what, what kind of characteristics our, our uh, personal characteristics a pastor should have, what the New Testament teaches us about the role of the pastor. And the third thing that we've been doing is that we have been spending some time looking at where God is working at Central Baptist Church. And the idea is we wanted to, to define characteristics of a pastor that will help us uh, uh, do that work that will be uh, complementary of the work that God has for us here at Central Baptist. So let me explain what this means. A lot of people ask the question, a lot of people want to know, what is God's will for my life? And we could ask that same question about Central. What is God's will for Central? Well, those are great questions, but they're the wrong question. See, the right question is, what is God's will? The first two questions still deal with our will. What, is, what does God want for my life or what does God want for my church? The right question is, what is God's will? The scripture teaches us that God is working all the time to achieve his purpose. And he's going to do that regardless of whether we help or not. He doesn't need us to help him. But he chooses to ask us to invite it. He chooses to invite us to, to join him in his work. And when we join him in the work that he's already doing, it means that we make great adjustments and come alongside him. And so what we've been doing is we've been looking to see where God is at work and trying to define what characteristics of a pastor would complement that work. We believe that this is such a vital process of our church that on September or on August the 11th, we're going to take a pause in some of our normal, normal service activities, and we're going to ask you to come along with us on this journey and hear from you about what you think God is doing in our church. Now, we're going to do that through a, through a survey, and this is not going to be the normal survey that you might have seen in the past. We're not going to ask you what, 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 how old a pastor you want or, or what kind of sermons you like. We're going to have you ask, identify for us where you see God working at Central Baptist Church and what characteristics of a pastor can help us with our purpose, which is to love, live for Christ, love people, and make disciples. Again, we, be, we believe this is so important that we wanted to put this in front of you with a lot of time for you to think about it. We're also going to take the, the two weeks prior to this survey we're going to spend time in each of the service coming together as a family to just pray for this process and to pray that God would show us where he's working, okay? So let me just recap. July the, July the 28th, we're going to take time, and, and August the 4th, we're going to take time in the morning worship service to just pray about this process, okay? And then August the 11th, we're going to take this survey. We're going to pray and take this survey. So the next thing that I'd like you to do for the next two weeks, I would like to just ask you to do one thing or at least to pray about one thing. I'd like you to pray that God will show you how to hear his voice. Let's do that and see where God takes us, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Don. Right now, uh, let's pray as we enter into worship, as we uh, kind of let go of the, the things that might be hindering us, the things that might be holding us back from hearing from God. Uh, and let's open our hearts to what God has for us this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, we are just so in awe of what you're doing in and through us, God. Through this church, through us individually, God, I pray that as we kind of push out all the distractions, God, that we, that we will just look to you. We will hope in you. We will who think on your things, God, that your thoughts that are bigger than our thoughts and your your ways that are different than our ways, God, I, I pray that we will just kind of hone into those for a moment, God. God, we just bring you our prayer. We bring you our uh, our offering, God. We, we, we bring you what, what, what we have in our life, the junk, God, and we just lay it at your feet, God. We know that you can do all things love you, Jesus. Bless this service. Bless what you are doing in this church, God, and let us hear from you. Speak to us, God, like only you can. We will give you all the glories. We will give you all the praise forever and always, God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand again and worship.
hear your people calling out with a rising shout. Let your name be praised. Oh, Yeah. 
melt and shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the once again that today we get to worship and have relationship with the creator of all things the God who walked in the garden with Adam the God who split the waters of a sea to save a whole nation the God who gave his one and only son. The God of old, yes, but the God of new, that you love us 
that your grace is here for us and that today we stand on holy ground again in your presence. And my prayer today is that you truly would have your way in my life and in our church. So have freedom here at Central today. We thank you for what you're gonna do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated this morning. Thank you, Ron, and the praise team. He is the great I am. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen? Yes, he is worthy to be praised, and we continue our praise and worship in our tithes and offering. Just a reminder, you can give online. That's right in front of you. There's this little tiny bookmark. You can grab that and do so. And we praise and worship him through our tithes and offering because we want to give to the kingdom. We want to give to kingdom work. We want to worship him and praise him. And by the way, thank you, family known as Central, for being so faithful to give and give to that kingdom of God. As the ushers are coming forward, let me remind you, tonight, VBS, we've already praised and worshiped God. There's going to be a lot of little ankle biters and rug rats running around. And let me remind you of this. It is a blessing and a praise and a worship for our holy God when kids come into the kingdom of God. Amen? When they ask Jesus Christ as Lord into their heart to be their Lord and Savior, and they become kids of the Most High God. They become our brothers and sisters. Some of you are going, thank God some of those kids become saved. Amen? Oh, my goodness. And that is because your faithfulness by you giving to kingdom purposes. And this is why we give to the kingdom of God. And we give also because of many ministries and missions right here through your tithes and offerings to the kingdom of God. And right now, our deacon of the week, Alan Beers, is going to come and pray for this time of worship. So, Alan, why don't you pray and ask God to bless these offerings? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you this morning, Father, just uh, looking up to you and th thinking how awesome you are, Father, how holy you are, Father, how perfect you are, Father. And as I think back to what we sang in first service this morning, I can only just repeat how great thou art, Father. Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for the time that we've already spent together as family, as through our fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, through the study of your word and through the first service this morning with Matt, shared his word or your word with us, Father. Thank you for that, Father. We look forward to tonight of our Bible school, Father, and uh, what an exciting opportunity it is to be able to welcome these kids into our church, Father, and to... Uh, to show them the love of Jesus Christ, Father, and to tell them about that and to welcome their moms and dads in the door and tell them that they're welcome here, Father, that we love Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you're going to do tonight, Father. I pray for Matt as he brings us the word to second service, Father. Speak through him. May we be different when we walk out the door today after we hear your word preached, Father. As we get ready to take up the offering, Father, I just pray that uh, that you would bless the giver, bless the gift, Father. I pray that somebody would come to know you as our personal Savior through our gifts today, Father. Just one person, I pray for that, Father. Thank you again for loving us. Thank you for being our Savior, Father. And I pray all this in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
All right, let's dismiss our kids to go off to Children's Church, ages four years old through kindergarten can be dismissed first right out those doors over there. first through fourth graders are having children's church today, so you can go ahead and head that way, first through fourth graders. You guys have a great time. I hope you got a friend in mind to invite to VBS this week. They're going to have a great time. Parents, head down that way. You'll find them down in our kids' wing after church when we dismiss here. Pappy's going to come and he's going to bring the word. So let's put our ears on. I want to thank uh, Kevin and the great job he did last week on letting go and grab hold and the message that he brought. And man, Ryland's and his praise team. You know, my prayer before I came up here was that God, you be lifted up and glorified. And how can you not have known and felt that during that praise and worship time, the great I am. You know, that, that's, that's been my prayer, is that we draw closer and closer so that when we say those words, the great I am, holy, holy, we begin to get a better understanding of that. Of course, we've got Vacation Bible School coming up, and so I'm excited about that tonight and all that's gonna lead to. Um, Charlene and I have been in this process of downsizing, <clears throat> and that just means in everything and all the stuff that we have, we're trying to, you know, have just less stuff. And you can imagine over the years how that can accumulate. Uh, I'm 61 years old, so I have a lot of stuff. And so we're, we're in the process of downsizing. And believe it or not, we went up in the attic and it was full. And we took everything out of the attic and 90% of it probably went to the dump to be honest with you. But we, there were some things that we wanted to hang on to. And in the beginning, there was about five tubs that were just nothing but memorabilia, just different things of the kids growing up and all that. And, and it's stuff that, you know, would probably mean something if I'd ever take the time to actually open it up and go through it. But I thought of all the people that would want to probably keep this and go through it would be Amber. She's going to be kind of like the scribe of the Flint family and just kind of keep all that stuff. And so to AJ's dismay, uh, I brought over about five tubs. They, I think they were gone or something. And his lawnmower was against the side of the wall and I moved his lawnmower and just put five big old tubs over there. And then we came across a couple more. So I think there's been about seven tubs of nothing but pictures and memorabilia and things like that. And uh, so I'm glad that she has that. But she's been posting those on Facebook, a few of them. Uh, and I look at them and I go, oh, ooh, you know, kind of like that. I really don't make a comment about it. But this one that she put up there made me laugh, not so much because of the picture, even though it's, it's me. It's my son's comment. If you could put that up on the screen there, uh, there's a, now this is when I would have been in my young 20s, and yes, you see the little arrow, and that's me. Uh, not that, you, you know, yeah, I wish I had that black hair again, but, uh, and that much hair, but the funny thing was what my son posted on there, uh, he, he said, my gosh, look at that, looks, my dad is like a Colombian drug lord on the <laughs> tarmac of the uh, airport, and, and, and right when I read that, I mean, I busted out laughing from that, and it was, I, it was just, it made my day, so uh, I really appreciate that she did that, and the humor that my two children have <laughs> as they make fun of me. The theme of VBS is in the wild, and, and what it is, it, the motto is actually this, zoom in, focus on me. Zoom in and focus. And what you're doing is you're having these encounters with Jesus as we walk through the book of, well, we're walking through a lot of different books in the Bible, but we're taking these different snapshots. It's as if there was a photographer or someone who's documenting Jesus' life. He's stopping, he's setting up his tripod, and bang, he takes a picture of this encounter along the way. And that's what we're doing. And so 
just a quick overview, day one, encounter at the temple. So this is when Jesus is 12 years old, and his parents are looking for him. He's there, and they find him. And the people, it says in that verse, the people were amazed at what Jesus was saying and the things that he was asking. Day two, encounter at the river. And this is where John the Baptist is baptizing, and Jesus comes up, and he gets to baptize Jesus. And you just think about it. John the Baptist, in a sense, got the reality of what the Trinity was because here he is taking the Son and baptizing him. The dove representing the Holy Spirit takes off and he hears God's voice say, this is my Son. I mean, what an amazing encounter. Day three, encounter on the water and this is where Jesus is walking on the water and Peter comes out to them and then, but then he calms the storm and the disciples realize this is the Son of God. Day four, encounter the tomb where Mary Magdalene comes up and she's expecting to find a body to, so she can finish the, the burial process, but the tomb is empty. And she has an encounter with Jesus at that time. And then day five, encounter on the road. And this is the road to Emmaus and where Jesus comes in contact with two different individuals and, and they're sharing with him and he starts to share with them and they're just amazed, but they don't realize it's Jesus until he breaks the bread and shares with him. Five different encounters. And I just want to encourage you, if you're not working in Vacation Bible School, and come to the adult VBS because Tim Gramley, this was put on his heart two or three years ago about doing Vacation Bible School for adults. And it has grown every year. And he's got a great lineup of speakers each night leading the lesson. And they do a lot of other things too. And so I would encourage you, be a part of Vacation Bible School even in the adult VBS, if you're not working, I would encourage you to be there. But if we'll put up the VBS scripture on here, it's John 20, 31. This is the scripture that all the kids are going to be memorizing. This is the thing that they're, you know, where they're going to get little treats for if they do it. And so, and it's really, really important. But look at that. It says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I, if I could challenge you with anything, memorize that verse. I mean, you've got a whole week to do it. Your kids are doing it. Maybe your grandkids are doing it. Even if you don't have anybody attending VBS, I just challenge you to memorize that verse because it's a great, great verse. This, this is out of the book of John. You say, well, what's so special about that? It's nothing special, the fact that this is out of John uh, chapter 20, 31, except the fact it's our memory verse for the week, but I want to kind of dig into this verse a little bit. There's two things that, and I'm going to keep this very short hopefully today, but there's two things that I want you to do as we're going through this, and the invitation will really be this. I want you to take a time and examine your heart and just ask yourself, where are you in your relationship with Christ? And number two, I'm going to challenge you to what could you do during this week for Vacation Bible School? It may be getting out of your comfort zone and coming to adult VBS. It may be praying for a certain individual. It may be coming up to Deborah and saying, you know, uh, I just feel led. To, I just need to do something. What can I do? Maybe it's emptying the trash. I don't know. But how could God use you during Vacation Bible School? Well, obviously in the Gospels, we had the four Gospels. we got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we call those the synoptic Gospels. And the reason we call them that is because of the similarities between the three. Each one of them is kind of repeating a lot of what the others, some add a little bit more. But you get the life of Jesus through those three Gospels, and that's why we call them the synoptic Gospels. But John is a little bit different. It's different for a lot of different reasons. First of all, and I have my red letter edition Bible up here out of the Holman Christian Study Bible, but whenever Jesus speaks, it's in red letter. And when you get to the book of John, there is a lot of red letters. The Synoptic Gospels were written before the Gospel of John. So when John is writing his Gospel, you get the sense of, I don't need to repeat everything that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were writing in there. I'm going to go in a different direction because I'm assuming th these have already been written about. Here's a couple of things that are in there. John does not list the 12 apostles. No formal institution of the Lord's Supper. No record of Jesus' birth. Nothing about Jesus being baptized, nothing about the transfiguration, nothing about the temptation in the desert, nothing about the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, and nothing about the ascension, because those were covered in the others. So, and about 90% of what's in the Gospel of John is not found in the Synoptic, of Gospel, the Synoptic Gospels. 
So the question you have to ask is, so why did John write his gospel? Look at that memory verse. I'm going to back up one verse, John 20, verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. Here we go. But these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. So here we go. we got two big old churchy words that we throw around, apologetics and evangelism. And apologetics is the defense of, of the gospel, of, of what's being shared here. And here we have it right there where you see that you have to believe what? You, John is writing this so that you'll believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And if you were to believe that, the evangelistic part is what? You may have life in his name. John used the verb to believe almost 100 times. In there, that's twice as many times as the, the synoptic gospels put together. John is the only one who stated why he is writing his gospel. It's right there in 31. John wanted to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. You start in the beginning, God incarnate, where John in, in first in, in chapter one of John, where he's writing about John about Jesus incarnate. He's the word. He's there in the beginning. Jesus was the Messiah. He, John wanted you to know that Jesus was the Savior of the world. He put in eight miraculous signs just to let you know that, he, that Jesus was, was the Messiah because only the Messiah could do these things. In order, they go like this, turning wine into water, the healing of the royal, royal official's son, the healing of a lame man, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on the Sea of Galilee, the healing of a man born blind, raising Lazarus from the dead, providing a miraculous catch of fish. And then last of all, Jesus' own resurrection, which is John chapter 20, verses 1 through 29. Which, guess what? Leads us right up to John 20, 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. He's just shared eight of them, and he's just saying there was a lot more. If you want some more, go read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But there was a bunch of them. But these are written so that you may believe Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John, Lee, John clearly presents in his gospel that when this message is proclaimed, people have a choice to either accept or reject that salvation only comes through Christ and believing that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. The Son of God. And it doesn't take long if you have a Bible that's in red print when Jesus speaks to get into the book of John and you start getting into a lot of red ink. Chapter 3 is when you start to see lots of red ink. And guess what chapter 3 starts out with? Jesus has an encounter with a Pharisee. This could be one of those that could have been in the VBS day where it was an encounter. Can you imagine setting up a tripod and watching and videotaping this encounter with a Pharisee? Who's the most famous Pharisee that we read about in the Bible? Well, it's Saul who later became the Apostle Paul. Look what Paul wrote about himself in Philippians this is in Philippians 3, starting in verse 3. He says, so For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. And this is where Paul has this flashback. And he said, Now let me share a little bit about my past and my history. Although I once also had confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has the grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised the eighth day, the nation of Israel, of the tribe of, ben of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. Now here, listen to these three things. Regarding the law, a Pharisee. Regarding zeal, persecuting the church. And regarding the righteousness that is in the law, Paul says, I was blameless. This is Paul boasting 
as a Christian, not boasting that, but he was just saying, this is who I was. I am not this anymore. But I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was persecuting the church. And when it came to the law, I was blameless. So what did Jesus think about the Pharisees? I wish I had time to read all these verses, but I've just picked a few. But your homework assignment, if you want to take it, is read Matthew 20, uh, Matthew, the whole chapter of Matthew 23. Because this is pretty much where Jesus just rips the Pharisees. Just a couple of verses, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You lock up the kingdom of heaven from people, for you don't go in and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses and make long prayers just for show. This is why you will receive a harsher punishment. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. Skip over to 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin, yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These things you should have, been, these things you should have done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, yet you gulp down a camel. And then it goes on and on, and when it gets down to verse 33, Jesus says this, snakes... Brood of vipers, how can you escape being condemned to hell? Jesus did not have a very high opinion of Pharisees. But yet, guess what? Chapter 3, here we go. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So not only did Jesus have a confrontation with a Pharisee, he had a confrontation of a Pharisee who was ruler of the Jews. And when you look that up, you'll find that he was part of the Sanhedrin. When you, when you study about this, Josephus was a historian at the time, and he wrote during the time of Herod the Great that there was about 6,000 Pharisees, but there were only 71 Sanhedrin. They were the ones that were in charge of, of, of applying justice in the civic rulers and things like that. You had to be very, very special to be a part of the Sanhedrin. So not only was Jesus meeting with a Pharisee, and you saw what he thought about Pharisees, but he's actually meeting kind of with the cream of the crop some of the Sanhedrin here. And, and Jesus says you have to be born again. And I, here's what I wanted to kind of explain away really quick. There's two or three sermons in the next few verses, 4 through 10, what it means to be born again. And so I, that's not where I'm going. I want to get to the believe part. But I don't want you to think because I'm skipping that that it's not important. But basically in a Reader's Digest version, what Jesus was telling Nicodemus about being born again is this. Everything that you've ever done and all these little laws you're keeping up, all your religious activities don't mean a thing because you have to be born again. You didn't have anything to do with your natural birth. And guess what, Nicodemus? You don't have anything to do with your spiritual birth. Quit trying to work your way to heaven. But what I want to get to, uh, well, let me even share this with you, what Paul said about what, you know, he already talked about how he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. But if you continue to read on in, in, in Philippians, verses 7 and 8, this is what Paul says about himself, about his past life. But everything that was a gain to me, I've considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them filth so that I may gain Christ. Here was Paul who knew what it was like to try to work his way into heaven, to, to try to hold the law and be blameless before it, but now he considers it all filth. But I want to jump down to the verses farther in John 3. Look in John uh, 
3, 14, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. This refers back to Numbers 21, 5 through 9, where the people had turned their back on God, and God sent snakes down to them, and they, as they were being bit by a snake, they would die. And the people cried out to Moses and said, Moses, intercede for us to God, because we know we have sinned a great sin, and how can we be saved? And, and Moses went to God and said, you know, what can we do? And God said, Put a serpent, a bronze serpent on a pole and lift it up. And if the people will look at it, they won't die. And the very next, next verse says this. And as Moses put this bronze serpent up and held it up, and the people who were bit and looked at it, they did not die. They had to believe in what Moses shared with them so they wouldn't die. Verse 15 in chapter 3, so that everyone who believes in him will have what? Eternal life. Verse 16, the most famous verse, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 18, anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. You jump to chapter 24, Jesus has this encounter with a Samaritan woman, and he looks at her and says, believe me. And, 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 and why should she believe him? Because in verse 25, the woman claimed, I know there's a Messiah coming, eventually a coming. And in verse 26, Jesus says, I am he. You have to believe me. Verse 48, Jesus says this, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Chapter 6, 29, Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he has sent. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. Verse 47, Jesus says again, I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. So you're sitting there going, okay, Matt, we get it. You got to believe. I did that. I said the Lord's Prayer. And I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. And I pray to God. That is everyone in here. I really, really do. Here's the thing that I want to challenge you with. Does your belief match up with the definition of what Christ says to believe? I am not trying to get anybody in here to doubt their salvation. But when it comes to eternal life, you don't want to mess around in this area. If you just back up a few verses from where we started in John 3, verse 1, Jesus has already thrown everybody out of the temple because they had made it a marketplace and it wasn't a place of prayer. And it says, in the, and the disciples remembered this after Jesus' resurrection. They remembered the verse about him being zealous. But the next three verses says a lot. John 2, 23 through 25 says this. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, in a sense, not believing to them. For he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, and here's the reason why, for he himself knew what was in man. If you go back in Greek and you look at all the different versions uh, in there, when it said the people believed in him, but Jesus says, I didn't entrust. A lot of your versions may say the people trusted Jesus, but then it says Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. It's the same form of the verb in Greek. Basically what it's saying is the people believed in Jesus, but Jesus didn't believe in their belief in him. Why? He gives you the answer. For he himself knew what was in man. This is a scary verse, and when he's doing the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 13 through 23, I'm just going to read you three verses. Starting in 21, it says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Basically, the people were going to Jesus saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we believe in you? And Jesus was saying them, to them, depart from me. I didn't believe your belief. A little bit more on this later, but I have someone who's going to come up, and he's going to share his personal testimony about how he came to believe in who Jesus Christ is really was and what, how important a relationship is. Matt McDaniel is going to come up and share right now. Thank you, Matt. For all of those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew McDaniels. I've been, uh, me and my wife, Kaylin and Wyatt, have been at this church for almost three years now. Um, and first and foremost, I want to give my testimony to you guys, and I want God to be glorified with it. Because he used it to save a man who was consumed by the world and a pathetic excuse at that, which was where I had stooped to. And so um, I was raised in a Southern Baptist church. My parents had always had us in church Sundays and Wednesday nights. But I had just taken up one of those chairs, you know, I knew about God and I knew who he was, but he wasn't for me. I didn't have any tangible evidence that he was real. Um, but I just said, you know, he, he, he might be real, but he's, he's not for me. And so I, I got older and the older we get, and without that personal relationship with God, we just drift away. And when we don't have him, all we have is the world. And the world began to consume me and ensnare me. And so as I got older, I was like, man, I need a change because, you know, stuff's not going my way. So I'm going to fix it. And so I joined the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps taught me awesome life skills on, on how to have good work ethic and character. And, but it also taught me how to take all of my issues, all my problems, and package them up in this small little box. I call it my heart-shaped box, and put them away, and tuck them away. And over time, you know, things piled up. And so after my, my six years, I got out, and I said, well, it gave me a purpose. I need to get the most out of this life, and I need to get an education. So I went and got my mechanical engineering degree. And, you know, upon getting that, I turned around and looked at what I had done, and I said, you know, look where I have, look where I have gotten myself. I'm a self-made man. You know, God, he was never there. I did this all by myself. And so, you know, by that time I had met Kaylin and we had gotten married and we had Wyatt. And it was time for us to make a big career change and we got the opportunity to move to Tulsa. And before we moved to Tulsa, Kaylin had given her life to Christ. And I knew God knew what he was doing because he was going to prepare her for what I was going to put her through. And so as I, we moved to Tulsa, you know, I kind of looked at her and I was like, you know, I don't know why. I kind of resented her because, you know, God didn't get me here. So what do you think you're going to do by giving your life to him? You know, I've been in control of my life, not God. And so we moved here and I immediately took the same work ethic that I had and applied it to my job, and I was successful and working on projects, and um, I was making good connections, and 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 I was on a and I was in a good spot. But uh, along with that, I was traveling, and then I'd come home, and I'd be dealing with her and Wyatt, and I began to fall again, the same repetitive pattern that I had gotten into, and so I kept thinking to myself, all right. It's time for another change. And so I had started to contemplate leaving them and abandoning them. And the more and more I contemplated it, it became a reality, just like everything else in my life. And so I, with that, was at high levels of anxiety and stress because look at you. Look what you're about to do. You're going to leave your wife and son, who Wyatt's only four, and you're going to go and pursue, you know, all of these things that will not matter. 
And so I believe it was on January 16th, you know, all this is building up inside me and my box, my heart shaped box was getting full and it felt like I was coming apart at the seams and it's like, wow, I'm, I'm not in control anymore. And so I was on 169, I had just landed and I was driving north back to my house and I put my hands up in the air and I looked up and I said, God, if you're real, you better show up because I'm going to do something really stupid. But it's the only way I know how to fix all my problems because I'm going to cut my baggage loose. And so that was on January the 16th. And then it's funny because Matt was talking about Paul, you know, he was, God came and spoke to him in Damascus and then blinded him. And then three days later, he was converted. And so three days later, it was a Friday and all of that stress and anxiety was building up and building up and building up. And, and I tried to go to sleep because I had to wake up on Saturday to go on a hunting trip. And um, so I was like, I'm just going to go to bed. So I went to bed and I had this dream and it was a vivid dream unlike most but how it started was I was falling into this black black pit and I couldn't wake myself up and everything that hurt you know any injuries any ailments it was just compounded and everything was just painful and it was so painful that I was like wow I gotta wake up because I'm I think I'm dying or something but I tried to pinch myself and I couldn't wake up like most dreams and so and I'm falling and I'm falling and it's like one of those bottomless pit f sensations and and then out of that pit, the Bible came out. And the pages just started kind of wisping, like you like you're thumbing through a book. And all the people in the Bible just started kind of popping up, kind of like a kid's playbook, you know, like a little children's book. And it was the stories of how they had thought they could do it on their own, which it's all there. And the Bible is so relevant because it's, it's true, and every word in it is true. And so, you know, as we begin to fall, you know, we, we cry out. And that's what every single person in the Bible did. They cried out to God because they tried to do it on their own, which they never were able to. And so, after that, I heard him speak to me, and he said, did you really think you could do it on your own? And then as soon as that happened, this sensation came around me that that person that you truly love in your life, like that, that, that mom or that dad or wife or spouse, whoever, that, that gives you that, that hug, that sense of security that you can feel those arms wrap around you. And that's what I felt. And he told me, he said, did you really think you could do it all on your own? You know, I've been here this whole time. And then on time, I, I woke up and I rolled over in bed and I shook Kaylin awake because she had already been asleep and I think it was like three or four in the morning. And I said, I want what you have because I hate myself and I hate what I've become. You know, I thought I could make it. Look, I served my country. I've got a great job, I got an education but yet I was gonna make one of the worst decisions that I could ever make in my life and that was I was gonna abandon the ones I love the most. And since then, you know, God has, has allowed me to use this testimony and talk to people and, and, and led me to, to where he's working because I just wanna leave you with these three things because I'm an engineer and I like notes, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, you need to stay in the scripture. At some point every day, make it a point to read scripture because it's all there and it is still relevant today, even more so because there's so many young men out there like me that, that, you know, if they don't have God, then they have the world and the world's getting worse and worse and worse. And you truly will get lost and by the time you could get out of, like me, and spin out of control. And so please make it a point to read your Bibles. Secondly, is talk to God. I don't care if you pray or act like he's sitting in that chair right there and you're just talking to him like he's your best friend because he'll listen. And he'll, 
and you can cast all of your problems and all of your anxieties to him. Because ultimately, we're not in control of our lives. We never have been. And so that leads me into the third point, was if you do those two things, you know, every day is not going to be a good day just because we're human. And it's just impossible for us. But God will reveal to you where he is working, whether it's with your coworkers, with, whether it's with your family, whether it's with strangers. He'll draw himself nearer to you. And, you know, and the Holy Spirit is in every single one of us. And it's Amen. just waiting to be unleashed. We just have to give up the control. Because ultimately we're not. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Matt. That's what I love about personal testimonies. They're all personal. That was his experience. Did you hear what he said? A relationship with God. That's what he wanted. I know it's a cheap plug, but you've heard uh, Don talk about joining God where he's at work and things like that. That comes out of a study called of Experiencing God, which is just a study. It's just a book pointing us back to God's word. If you're ever interested in, in learning more about that and what Matt experienced there about seeing where God was at work around, whether it's his family or his coworkers, and joining him. Next time Experiencing God class comes up, you might want to look at that. So tonight we got Vacation Bible School. And we have that one verse up there, John 20, 31. But what you may not be aware of is that each day there's a daily verse. The first four of them come out of the book of John. John 6, 38, 134, 14, 1, and 14, 6. The book that says what? Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And if you'll believe it, you will have life. You'll have eternal life. So four of those are out of the book of John. But day five is Romans 10, 17. And let me close on this. <clears throat> I'm going to back up just a couple of verses in Romans. This is Romans 10, starting at verse 14. But how can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, oh, I love this verse, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. But all did not obey the gospel, for as Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? And here's the verse of the day for day five. So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Jesus Christ. If there's anything that we can learn, and there's a million things we can learn about the parable of the soils, but if there's anything that we know for sure, it has nothing to do with the sower. Yes, Jesus is the ultimate sower of the seed. But just like we read in that verse there, blessed are those Blessed are the feet of those who are doing what? Sharing the gospel message. And what's the seed in the parable of the soils? It's God's word. So it really has nothing to do with who is sowing the seed. And the seed is God's word. It has everything to do with the soil. And when you read in Matthew 13, verse 19, you see that the soil, it says, what was sown in his heart. Satan comes and snatches the seed away off that hard path. But it was the soil. This week, we're going to have in this building lots of little kiddos running around. And I hope we have lots of adults in Adult Vacation Bible School. But there's a good chance, out of everyone who's come to VBS, we're going to have all four soils represented. Yes, the hard 
We may have a few with a hardened heart, and we may have a few with the rocky soil where when they hear the word, it springs up really quick, but then the sun takes away. Or maybe the soil with the, where the worries and the things of the world take them away. But we're also going to have some people here with a good soil that's ready to hear the word. We just need the sowers. Remember at the beginning, I asked you to do two things, and this will be my invitation. One, I want you to examine your heart. Where are you? I have a testimony similar to Matt's in the sense of I went to church a lot, and I knew Jesus up here, but I never let control allow him to be Messiah, never let him be Savior and Lord of my life until I was age 30. So part of my invitation is this. I want you to examine your heart. Maybe your walk with Christ isn't what it should be. Maybe you're still on milk and you need to move to meat. What would that take? What would it take you to make your relationship with Christ grow? Take it to grow from maybe a three to a four or a six to a seven. The other thing I want you to do when we have our invitation here in a time of prayer is just say, Lord, I have... I have no idea what's coming this week, but I want to be available to be used by you. And we have opportunities every night from 6 to 8.30. Who knows? It may be coming to sit in adult VBS and make a new relationship with somebody that you never would have met if you hadn't come. And who knows where God may take that. So my invitation is going to be this. I want to have you bow your heads in just a second. And I'm just going to, we're going to spend some time in just quietness where you can go before God and have him examine your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, only you can draw people to yourselves. Only you can convict us of our sins. So I pray right now that, Heavenly Father, that if there's anyone in here who may have some questions about their walk with you, maybe even their salvation experience, Lord, I I pray they won't leave until maybe they, they talk with someone, even if it's not staff. Talk with someone about this. Lord, I, I pray that if there's anyone in here who's feeling a little weird to get out of their comfort zone and be a part of VBS, that maybe tonight they'll just come and, and whether they, maybe if there's not a spot open to be used in the children's area at all, I understand that, but they could come to adult VBS and be a part of that. Who knows the encounter that they may have. My prayer is, that the encounters they have will be with the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, we'll have eternal life. We ask this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. Church, can we just say thanks again to both Matts this morning for the message they brought. (laughs) You know, my fear whenever... I heard this message, the first service, and then hearing it again, the second service is that I'd say most of us in here would say, yeah, I'm a believer, right? I believe. Um, I was reading a book a couple weeks ago uh, called The Red Letter Revolution that said, Shane Claiborne said, that the problem with most churches is that the vast majority of people believe, but there's very few followers. And that's true, I think. You know, it's easy for us to say we believe. James 2 says that even the demons believe, right? But are we following in the footsteps of Jesus? If there's not spiritual fruit in your life, examine your heart, speak with one of our ministers today, 
and let God work on you. Thank you for being here this morning at Central. It's gonna be an amazing week of Vacation Bible School, and we hope that you'll jump in and be a part of it with us. So as we're dismissed, I'm gonna invite you to stand and gather your things and get ready to leave or visit, find your friends and those kinds of things, but let's say our purpose statement together, reminding ourselves what we're gonna do when we leave this place today. Central Baptist, we exist to live for Christ, love people, and make disciples. You're dismissed. See you later.